the new constitution drew bright and indisputable borders around Cherokee territory and declared the Cherokee nation's absolute sovereignty within those borders. Georgia reacts to the Cherokee passage of a constitution in 1827 very badly. They say, if they set up a constitutional government, we'll never be able to get rid of them. The absolute title to the lands in controversy is in Georgia, read one resolution. And she may rightfully possess herself of them when and by what means she pleases. These misguided men, a state legislator said of the Cherokees, should be taught that there is no alternative between their removal beyond the limits of the state of Georgia and their extinction. As the Georgia legislature began to kick back, other more ominous events were unfolding. The discovery of gold in Cherokee territory, which caused a stampede of white prospectors, and the first stirring of a populist political movement that sent tremors through Indian lands all over the East. This hard-edged new movement found voice in Andrew Jackson, whose ascent to the presidency in 1829 owed to the newly enfranchised Southern frontiersmen. In his first address to Congress, President Jackson announced his intention to do as his voters pleased, which is to say rid the East of the Indian tribes once and for all. He championed new legislation, giving him power to offer the tribes land west of the Mississippi, if they would go nicely. The Indian removal bill was Jackson's first priority once he was in office. It became the first major focus of his administration. It did reflect a fundamental shift in the way that America was beginning to define itself. Not very many people in Georgia and Tennessee, Alabama at that time, were willing to even go so far as to say that Indian people were people. The thinking of the day becomes more racist, that um, the Cherokees are inferior and cannot be like the whites. It's convenient rhetoric to say that Cherokees are inferior and we need to get them out of the way, out of harm's way, as Jackson would put it. Saying that other tribes read the bleak signs and reluctantly began to prepare for removal. But the Cherokees reached out for support among their friends and benefactors along the eastern seaboard. The Cherokees were one of the civilized tribes. They had made such strides. So they cut a sympathetic figure to Northeasterners. I ask you, shall red men live or shall they be swept from the earth? It's with you. And this public at large, the decision chiefly rests. Must they perish? Will you push them from you or will you save them? The congressional debate over the Indian removal bill was a sectional brawl that drew the entire country's attention. A campaign organized by benevolent ladies flooded Congress with pro-Indian letters and petitions. Who can look an Indian in the face, one senator thundered and say to him, for more than 40 years, we have made to you the most solemn of promises. We now violate and trample upon them all, but offer you in their stead another guarantee. New England senators voted 11 to one against Jackson's removal bill, but the unanimous block of Southerners assured its passage in the Senate. The vote was closer in the House, 102 to 97, but the legislation passed and President Andrew Jackson's signature made Indian removal the law of the land. The state of Georgia basically said to its citizens, this land is yours. They divided up with the land lottery and basically uh, 
told their people to have at it. While white settlers bought up lottery tickets and a chance at Cherokee land, the Georgia legislature bent itself to obliterating the state within its state, passing new laws overriding Cherokee sovereignty. Meetings of the Cherokee legislature and courts were deemed illegal. All people residing on Cherokee land were now subject to Georgia law. Missionaries who had lived among the Cherokees for years were forced to sign oaths of allegiance to Georgia. Those who refused were jailed. And Jackson basically told Cherokees that he couldn't do anything about it. It was state rights. And, you know, they couldn't have any protection from, from the federal government. The only way they were going to get protection was if they moved. Making a plan to battle Andrew Jackson and Georgia fell to the Cherokees' newly elected principal chief. Major Ridge had decided not to run for the office, asserting that the Cherokees would be best served by an English-speaking chief. His own son was too young, so the Ridge backed John Ross. At 38, Ross himself was barely eligible, but he won election easily, and one of his first acts in office, rewriting the blood law, sent a clear signal. Any Cherokee who made a deal to sell land to the United States without the consent of the entire tribe faced dire and certain consequences. Citizens of this nation, the law read, may kill him or them so offending in any manner most convenient. Chief Ross then set out to shame Jackson and the supporters of Indian removal and he was going to use the United States federal courts to do it. Along with America's most esteemed advocate, former Attorney General William Wirt, Ross and his closest advisors began to frame the Cherokees' argument for self-determination in their own territory. Let's go on. The Cherokee Nation and their supporters filed more than a dozen separate suits in federal court. Two made it all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. The question in both cases was the flashpoint of American politics in 1830. Where did federal authority end and states' rights begin? Did federal treaties with the Cherokee Nation supersede Georgia state law? Or could Georgia do as she pleased within her borders? The court dodged the question in the first case, but in the second, Worcester v. Georgia, it could not. Samuel Worcester, a missionary who lived in the Cherokee Nation, had been jailed by Georgia officials for refusing to take an oath of allegiance. Wirt argued that his arrest was unconstitutional, that Cherokee tribal laws could not be written over by the state of Georgia. The opinion of the court, written by Chief Justice John Marshall, could not have been more clear. The Cherokee Nation is a distinct community, Marshall wrote, occupying its own territory, with boundaries accurately described, in which the laws of Georgia can have no force, and which the citizens of Georgia have no right to enter, but with the assent of the Cherokees themselves. What else could you ask for but a very clear and sympathetic order of the highest court in the land interpreting the supreme law of the land and the Cherokees just were ecstatic they followed the law they followed this policy of a government to government relationship and the supreme court decision was a complete vindication now finally this is their victory now they'll have some protection. 
John Ridge was still in Washington when he got word that the state of Georgia was refusing to recognize the Supreme Court decision or the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation. He goes to the White House and gets an audience with President Jackson. He asked him bluntly if he will force Georgia to comply with the Supreme Court's order. And Jackson says he will not. Andrew Jackson, the only president in the history of the United States to openly defy a Supreme Court order. He is said to have remarked that Chief Justice Marshall made his decision, let him enforce it. And to the Georgians, he said, light a fire under them. They'll move. It's over. He wants us gone. Even those we call friends say we can't resist anymore. The political reality setting in, the issues became more clear. You could stay and fight or stay and resist or leave. And it was a very painful decision. It was an emotional decision. And it was the United States driving us intentionally into that uh, choice. Once Jackson had openly sided with Georgia, every day brought fresh stories of Cherokees being whipped, run from their farms, and even killed by white Georgians and the Cherokee Nation didn't have the strength to fight them off. When the United States renewed its offer of a cash settlement for Cherokee territory and a grant of land west of the Mississippi, the Ridges were ready to listen. At this point, the Ridges see the yielding of land as inevitable. What it's coming down to in their minds is a choice between preserving their land are preserving their sovereignty. So they believe it's more important to remain a sovereign nation and distance themselves from the threat that's imminent. I'm told it is much like here. We'll come to think of it as home. Well, it is far. Too far for others, but not for us. They would have us leave our land and take up way out to the west, here. John Ross was a man in the middle. He knew where the people stood, but the Ridges were Cherokee aristocracy, esteemed leaders in the nation. The family had plenty of friends in the US government, and Ross was not happy that John Ridge was preparing to run against him for principal chief in the upcoming tribal elections. This infighting, Ross believed, invited peril. He'd seen federal negotiators divide and conquer the leadership of every other nearby tribe. Unity, he knew, had been the Cherokee's salvation. The tribe 